Certainly it's good to be back worshiping the Lord again this evening. Appreciate so much the opportunity that God has granted to us to be able to, to do just that. If you're visiting here at Lakeside, we're glad that you have chosen to come and be with us and uh, just appreciate the encouragement that you have given to us. You know, I need to take just a moment and uh, kind of explain some things. I, you know, when uh, this meeting was uh, kind of rescheduled, you know, I was in communication with Josh during, during the time of rescheduling this, and uh, Josh and I talked about some, some lessons that he thought would be uh, pretty appropriate, especially after coming off of what we experienced in, in 2020. And so that's what I've tried to do this week. Some of these lessons may seem to be overlapping just a little bit, but it's intended to get us uh, uh, excited again, get us, uh, you know, away from fear, and, uh, and, and, and just try to get back to where we need to be as the people of God. And, uh, and, and hopefully that's what, uh, that's what I've been able to accomplish. Now, tomorrow night, I'm going to be taking a study from something Jesus said in a conversation with someone who was questioning him one time. Uh, about the, uh, the, you know, what to do to have eternal life, one of the great commandments, and that is to not only love God, but to love our neighbor as ourself. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow night and see, see what, uh, what, it, what is involved in, in that. But this evening, I want to remind you of something that's said, and it's just kind of almost, it's really in the context of Enoch in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Uh, and it's almost something that we just kind of read through sometimes. But in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, the writer tells us that uh, what we need to do is, is, as far as our faith is concerned, he, he, he says that faith, without faith it's impossible to please him. That is God. And he says, he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That says some very important things. Two of which is that we have to believe that God is. And the second thing about that that we have to believe, we have to believe that God is good. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now that reminds me, you know, of a child's prayer uh, that would, would often be said, you know, God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for our food. And, 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 and that concept, while it's simple and while it's elementary, it is very profound because it certainly describes what the Hebrew writer is describing about the goodness of God. And so when we think about the God that we serve, the God of the Bible, the God who created this world and all that is in it, one of the things that we have to recognize is the goodness of God. Yes, we recognize the majesty of God. We recognize the glory of God, the riches of His glory. All of those things are to be recognizable, but we also have to recognize that God is good. And sometimes that's hard for us to do when we begin to look around and we see all of the things that we're experiencing while upon this earth. And as a result of that, very often we tend to want to blame God for all of the things that are happening. And as a result of that, I believe God is getting a bad reputation because people are blaming God for things that God is not responsible for. You know, uh, the author... Uh, Virginia Woolf said one time, she said, I read the book of Job last night and I don't think God comes out well in it. And the reason is she sees that all the sufferings that happened to Job, she wants to heap them upon God. Well, God brought all of these things upon Job. So God doesn't come out too good in the book. Well, there's a couple of things about that. Virginia Woolf doesn't understand uh, God, nor does she understand the book of, of Job. But this is something that is gaining kind of universal uh, belief. As a matter of fact, about 11 years ago, abcnews.com says this about God. And I'll just read the second paragraph here. On the website, it says, and it, now it turns out lots of ordinary folks are angry at God. And it goes on to ask the question, why does he allow babies to starve in the third world country? Countries, why does he allow bad things to happen? And why does he either actively or passively cause so much grief? And so this is the problem that people are having with God. They look at all of these bad things. Why does God allow or permit or even cause these bad things to happen? And so God is getting a bad reputation. And I want to tell you something. That's not just happening out in the world among them. 
uh, unbelievers or among sectarians or among atheists or agnostics. There's several of us among the people of God. We struggle with this. We struggle with the idea that if God is good and God is loving, then why did this happen? Why are all of these bad things happening? For example, we, we, we look out and, and, and we see that, well, here, here's a young married couple who wanted a child very desperately and they have a child and that child is a few weeks or a month or so old and suddenly it dies with SIDS. God did it, according to a lot of people. God is responsible for that, and sometimes in our feeble efforts to even offer some consolation, we'll make some really ridiculous comments. Well, you know, God may have needed him more than you. And what we're saying there is, God did it. Well, what does that do to God's reputation? A family member is killed in an auto accident, and we come away believing God did it. God, why did you do this, or why did you permit this to happen? A tornado devastates cities and families, and God did it. It's often referred to as an act of God. A tsunami kills thousands. God did it. Terrorists, terrorists in the Middle East or in this country even, will murder thousands of innocent people. God did it. And then HIV, AIDS epidemic. Well, that's something God brought on. God did it. COVID-19, we look at the, uh, all that we've experienced because of this. Well, you know, God did it. And so when we, when we reach that conclusion, what we're doing is we're attacking the integrity of God. We're attacking the character of God. And we're saying that God is responsible for all of these bad things that have come upon us. But I believe, I believe in the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew, when Jesus gave a very simple parable. In that parable, even though he was not addressing what I'm addressing this evening, I believe he gives us the template to understand why these things are happening, why we experience these things, and it, it cannot lie at the, at, at, at the feet of God. In, 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 in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives a parable that is often referred to as the parable of the wheat and the tares. I'm not going to read the parable. I'm not going to preach from the parable. But what I want to do is just kind of remind you of what is occurring in this story. Jesus tells about a farmer, a landowner, who sows a field of wheat. And he's got some workers working for him. And then he finds out from these workers that not only is there wheat sown in this field, there are tares sown in this field. That is darnel, and these are just simply toxic weeds that look like wheat. And they're growing up with the wheat. And so the farmer, the, 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 farmer, the landowner, uh, is faced with the possibility of just, you know, wrecking the wheat with taking out the tares. And he chooses not to do this. But the point is in the story, when he comes to talking about who's responsible for this, the landowner wasn't responsible for this because the landowner planted only good wheat. And you know what he said? He said, an enemy has done this. Who sowed the wheat? The good farm, the good landowner. Who sowed the tares? An enemy has done this. Now when Jesus gives an explanation to the parable, he identifies the enemy. And he said, the enemy who, has sowed, who sowed them is the devil. And here's something we need to wrap our mind around because we're getting to the to the uh, root of the matter, who's responsible for all of these things that are occurring. He said, an enemy has done this. Well, who is the enemy? He said, the enemy is the devil. And it's the same one that Peter talked about in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. He said, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. So let me tell you something. The one who's responsible for all of these things that I just talked to you about a moment ago is not God. We cannot lay these at the, foot, at the feet of God. Now, does God permit things like this to happen? Yes, because God has permitted us with a freedom of choice. And in order for these things not to happen, then God's going to have to remove choices from His creation, and we're just simply going to be a bunch of animated cabbage heads. And the God didn't create us that way. We're created with the ability to choose, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But who's responsible for these things is an enemy. An enemy has done this.
And what we need to do is we need to begin to know who our enemy is. And our enemy is the devil. The devil is the enemy of God's people. And if we're going to know our enemy, then we're going to have to learn some things about our enemy. Now I want you to, I want to just stop and think a little bit. I'm going to just give about four or five verses here for us to consider. Let's consider the devil for just a moment. The devil is the enemy of God and the enemy of God's people. The devil is the adversary of all mankind. The devil is said to be the God of this age. And the devil is said to be, in Revelation chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 9, the devil is said to be the evil serpent of old. Listen to what is said in Revelation 12 and verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, when we talk about the devil here, I tell you what I want us to stop and do. I, I want us to stop doing the, you know, just thinking that the devil is some red-suited, pitchfork-carrying, little mischievous urchin. Or the devil is somebody that just comes out at Halloween and things like this, and we've got this visual of who the devil is. No, the devil is the enemy of all mankind. Now, I, I don't know the origin or the source of the devil, and I don't believe Revelation 12 is giving us the origin or the source of the devil. But what I see here is that what the writer is telling us is that the devil goes all the way back, and he identifies the devil with the serpent in Genesis chapter 3 who deceived Adam and Eve. And we're going to go back to that in just a moment. Because he's giving us here, I believe, an insight into all the problems that we're experiencing in this world. It is the devil who is responsible for all of the things that we experience that we often want to lay at the very feet of God. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Let's go back and understand some things about the devil. So while you're opening your Bible to Genesis chapter 3, I want you to keep this in mind. When God created the heavens and the earth, God created this pristine paradise called Eden. And in this pristine paradise, God placed Adam. And Adam, while he was in that paradise, he was able to identify the animals that God had created, but there was not a helper suitable to him. That is, he wasn't, there wasn't any companion that he could find that was like himself. It wasn't found in the animal kingdom. It wasn't found among the cattle or the birds or the fish. There's nothing in there that would identify him, identify for him a companion. So what God did is cause a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and from his rib, or from his side, he took a rib and he created a woman. And then he brought her to the man. There was the helper that was compatible and comparable to him. It was someone who was like him, but it was someone who was completely different from him, and they were placed in this pristine paradise. And God told them to tend the garden, and God told them that they could eat from every tree in the garden with the exception of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. And so this is just kind of setting up the scene here. But things begin to change in chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. That goes back to what we read in Revelation 12 and verse 9 that identifies this as the devil. Now whether the devil used a serpent or whether the devil appeared as a serpent, I'm not going to speculate. But what I do know is this, rep this is the devil represented here. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has... God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. So let's stop right here and let's begin to evaluate some things. One of the first things that we're going to learn is that it is Satan and not God who is the source of all our temptations. It is the devil and not God who is the source of temptation in this world. Now, after saying that to the woman, the woman reminded the devil, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But now notice in verse 3. He said, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. 
For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So who is the tempter here? Who is the one that is seeking to draw Eve into sin? Who is it? Is it God? No. God placed her and Adam in the garden, told them that they could have everything they wanted with the exception of this one tree. You see, that's the choice that God gave to them. Now, had God removed their ability to choose, there would not have been that choice taken because they couldn't have done it. It is the devil and not God. You remember what James said in James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, neither does he tempt any man. But he said man is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. This is exactly what we see here. The devil is... Hey, let me ask you something. You think Eve knew where this tree was? Do you think Eve knew about that tree? Do you think she knew that she was not to eat of that tree? The answer to that is yes, yes, and yes. She probably had walked by that tree hundreds of times. I don't know, I'm speculating, but she knew where the tree was. Had she looked upon it before? Absolutely. But now, you see, it begins to look different. Now the devil is focusing on some things. And hey, if you eat from this, you're going to be just like God, knowing good and evil. Did you ever wonder about that? Did she not know before she ate from that fruit that it's evil to eat of it? Did she not know the difference between good and evil? Well, you'll be like God. You, you'll be able to discern good and evil. We see the whole idea there is you will be like God and you can determine what's good and evil without God. And so that's what the temptation was. I can be just like God. I can determine what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil. I don't need God to tell me these things. Plus, plus, she's going to be able to experience something she's never experienced before. You know, you're going to be able to experience what it's like to be God. You're going to experience what it's like to make these choices and these decisions without being encumbered by the commands of God. And so she ate. But who's responsible for this? Is it God? No. God is not the source of our temptation. The devil convinced Eve that God was trying to deprive her, and that caused this to look differently. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, verse 6. That it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit. And ate, she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So what, what, what's the point of all of this? What, what, what's the, what, what do I see in this? Well, let, let, let me break it down like this. We, we read in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, after Jesus was baptized, he was taken into the wilderness to be tempted by who? By the devil. And in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 4, we find that when the tempter came to him, we know about the temptations of Jesus. Remember when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5, he said he was concerned for them lest the tempter had tempted them. Who is the tempter? Is it God? No. The tempter is the devil. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5, when Paul was talking to married couples and telling them, you know, if you're going to stay away from the marriage bed for prayer and, and fasting, that's fine, but come together again, lest Satan tempt you for your lack of self-control. So the point of all of this is this. It is the devil and not God who is responsible for all of our temptations. God did, and here's the application, God did not create in us a genetic predisposition to sin. It is not there. God did not put in our program, He did not program our DNA with some sort of inclination or orientation to sin. I hear about people talking about their sexual orientation. As though God has placed in some people a desire for, uh, you know, a, a, a temptation that He did not put in others a temp uh, to the same temptation. I, I hear this all the time. The, tempt the tempter is the devil. Temptation comes from without. Responses come from within. God did not predispose us for this. God does not place us in, a, in an occasion that was going to lead us into sin. 
Well, you know, I, 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 just, I just found myself in, 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 in no, no, you, you, you put yourself there. It wasn't that God led you into that temptation. God does not lead us into evil. We are tempted when we are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. What the devil does is seek to awaken within us desires for that which is sinful, desires for that which is harmful, desires for that which is forbidden. But I'm going to tell you every time that those temptations come, it's not God doing it. Either by putting some orientation within us or an occasion for us to sin. No, it's not. God didn't do it. It's the devil. It's the devil. But here, here's, a good, here's a good thing to know about that. We don't have to yield. There's no temptation taken us, but such is common demand. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. But with the temptation, God will provide. God will provide. Not the temptation. But God will provide the exit. God will provide the egress. God will provide a means of escape. That's what God will do. But the problem is sometimes we close our eyes and we don't want to see that escape route. And then we'll blame God. Well, it's just the way that I am. You hear people talking about that? They may have a wicked temper. You know, they may allow something to happen that just, you know, just sets them off. And then, then their response to that is God is responsible for my temper. Well, what do you mean? Well, that's just the way that I am. I've always been that way. No, it, it, you may have always been that way, but, you're, but God is not responsible for the way you are. It's your choice and how you respond to what's happened. So the devil and not God is the source of all our temptations. Well, let's continue. We're going to read on and we're going to find in our study that it is that Satan and not God who's responsible for us being alienated or separated from God. Now let's notice now as we pick up our reading in verse 6. Well, we, saw, we read it a moment ago. We'll not read it again. The woman saw that the tree was good and she and her husband ate. Now notice in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And now notice what they did. They didn't seek to have communion with God. They didn't seek to have fellowship with God, a fellowship that they had enjoyed before the sin. So what did they do now? Well, when they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the cool of the day, or in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now, just, just picture that now. Picture that. Sin that the devil had introduced, temptation that the devil had introduced and they succumbed to, now destroyed the relationship that existed between God and his creation. It's the devil and not God who has separated us from God. It is the sins that we commit that separate us from God. You know, I hear people talking about, I just don't feel close to God. I just don't feel there's any relationship that I have with God. Well, what is the problem? Has God moved off His throne? Has God moved away from you? No. It's the fact that your sins have caused you to hide yourself from God. It is the devil and not God who seeks to alienate us, who seeks to cause us to be separated from God. Isaiah put it this way. In Isaiah 59, in verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. That's the problem. The problem is our sins separate us from God. Paul pointed out in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 that before the Gentiles came to God, they were without God in this world and as a result of that they were without hope in this world. This is where we are when we try to live without God. And it's the devil that causes this, not God. God wants to have fellowship with us. God wants to have communion with us. But what happens is we commit a whole lot like old Saul in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 28 and verse 15 when he sought to conjure up 
Samuel from the dead. And, and, and why was this? Well, God has departed from me. Well, why did he do that, Saul? Why did God depart from you? Was it because God is an evil God? No. It is because of the sins that Saul was doing and involved in. You, you, you notice, ladies and gentlemen, how many people there are in our culture and in our society that feel that they want to eliminate any vestige of God? You, you know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. There is a good element of our culture and in our society and really throughout the world who wants to eliminate any concept of God from the public square. We can't talk about God in school. We can't talk about God in government. We can't talk about God on the public square. We can't talk about God even in a lot of the social media sites. We can't. We got to get rid of God. And I want to tell you something. When you do that, when you do that, what you're doing is moving further and further and further away from God and any, any goodness that is associated with God. You know, in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible reminds us that it was Cain who raised up and, slay, and, slay, and killed his brother Abel. But I want you to notice something that happens after, after Cain does this. In verse 16 of Genesis chapter 4, we find then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. To me, that is a very sad picture here. He went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, the way the King James and New King James and possibly many other translations render this, that it looks to be about okay because he goes to this land called Nod. And so everything's going to be fine. Well, this idea of not is just a, a wandering. It's not necessarily a, a, a location in like going from here to Monticello or here to Lexington. And he goes out and, and wandering, and he's wandering out of the presence of God. And, and to me, that, that's very sad. But if you want to see what that looks like, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks exactly like the Apostle Paul was writing about in Romans chapter 1. Because now he's talking about a culture and a people who decided that they wanted to have life without God. And so what do they do? You know, they just could miss sin after sin after sin. And you know what they do? God gave them up to uncleanness. They, like Cain, went out from the presence of the Lord. And now they are wandering in the desert of sin. Well, what does it look like for them to do that? Well, in verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, I can't help but think about it. The number of people who worship trees and nature and climate and animals. Uh, you know, this is what happens when you stop worshiping God. They worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. I don't need to paint you a picture. You know what he's talking about. And he says, Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Now, if you want to see what that looks like in real time, all you have to do is turn your television on and see some of the gay parades that occurred during this so-called, uh, you know, month of June that was a celebration. And you get an idea of what this is like. You want to see how God feels about that. Read the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis and you see the condemnation that came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Is it God's fault? No, it's the devil's fault who introduced all of this and caused people to leave the presence of God because of their sins and wander in the desert of sin. And he goes on. He said, and even they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. They're filled with all unrighteousness. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, they're whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent. He's describing a people without God. He's describing a people who go out from the presence of God. Is this what we want? 
Well, we can't blame God for this. It's choices that are being made. And you know, yeah, I gotta tell you, let me tell you something. Do you know why there are? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't I, I don't have statistics. I didn't I, I didn't see any need to get, get statistics like this. But you look in the, the city of Chicago, the number of murders that happen in Chicago. Do you know why that's happening? Do you know why there's the number of murders that they are in the city of Louisville? Or the city of San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York. You, you just name the city. You name where it's Do you know why these are happening? They're happening because people want to live without God. They've bought into the devil's lie. And yet they, 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 they want to separate themselves from everything that's good. Why is all the hate and the bigotry and the wars, the stalkings, the senseless slaughter, the pe pedophilia, and all of this is going on? It's because men and women have decided they want to live their lives without God. They're alienated from God. It's not God's fault. It's the devil. With all the alcoholics and the drug overdoses, this is not God's doing. It's the devil's doing. So let's know our enemy. Our enemy is responsible for all of mankind's despondency. I've got verse 8 there, but I want you to look at verse 10 of Genesis chapter 3. Because this brings us into the idea of what despondency is and what brings it about. We find in verse 10, so he said, this is after his conversation with, uh, God's conversation with Adam. Where are you, Adam? And Adam said, I, I, I hid, and God wanted to know why, why he did that. He, he said, I, I, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself you know it's hard here's the truth of the matter it's hard to live with ourselves when we rebel against God here was Adam that committed sin and now his eyes were open and he realized what kind of condition he was in and, 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 and he seeks to avoid God he, he's afraid now fear has entered into his heart he, he's afraid and, and he wants to stay away from God. He wants to, to get as far away from God as he could because of this. Well, you know, i got to tell you, it's hard to live with oneself. When we know what we're doing is wrong, we know what we're doing is detrimental to our health and detrimental to other people. I, I think of what David wrote in Psalm 51 after he was rebuked by Nathan for his sin with Bathsheba. David said in this prayer of repentance in verse 1 of Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Here is a man who is broken because of his sin. He said, Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And iniquity there carries with it the idea of depravity. He said, And cleanse me from my sin." For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. That is the guilt of my sin is always before me. He said in verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned. So who is responsible for that? Who is responsible for the feelings of despondency and melancholy and anxiety that we have? It's not God. God is not responsible for that. The devil introduced this into the world. Our enemy brought this into the world. And this is, what, this is what Paul is really talking about when he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, describing his former life. He said he was an insolent man. He said he was a blasphemer. He did all of these evil, evil things. And he says this in verse 15. He said, it's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He said, however, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. You know, I love what Paul says here because what Paul is saying here, hey, you know what, I, I was probably the worst human being that ever lived, at least he was in his own mind. He said, I was the greatest sinner that ever walked the face of this earth, but he said, I didn't have to live that way. He said, I, I came out of it. Hey, you know, here's the thing about that. In, in, in Acts chapter 9, when he was confronted on the road to Damascus, Jesus told him, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. And we're not necessarily talking about what a goat is as far as men driving oxen, but here's what the application of that is. 
When you're doing wrong and you learn the truth, it's hard for you to keep doing wrong if you are an honest person. You can't live that way. You have hidden yourself from God long enough. And it's time to step up to the plate and accept responsibility for what you've done. It's not God's fault you are where you are. I mean, let, me, let, let me tell you something. In, in the neighborhood I grew up in, in Louisville, Kentucky, on the block where I lived, there was families that lived next door to each other. It was two men who were brothers and their families. They lived right next door. Had houses looked just alike, both the same color house. Now, in this one family, there was two brothers there, and this other family that lived next door had, had one son and a cousin to these guys next door. Now, these, three bro these two brothers and cousins, they would often get together, and they, it kind of vandalized the neighborhood, intimidate people, and get in trouble at school, get in trouble with the law. Uh, they, they just involved themselves in all kinds of petty crimes. And now, let's, let's fast forward a little bit. One of the brothers is now living in St. Petersburg, Florida, after serving a long stretch in prison for drug trafficking. And his brother is in prison tonight, as I speak to you, for armed robbery and a repeat offender. Now, the cousin that was running with them, doing the same thing that they were doing, the cousin is standing before you preaching the gospel tonight. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to continue in those kinds of activities. If it breaks your heart, God is dealing with you. It's, it, it, the devil is the one that introduced all of this stuff. The devil has caused all of this despondency and this concern and this anxiety that we have, and we self-medicate ourselves. We deaden it with pain. We deaden it with anxiety. And I'll tell you what my cousins and I were trying to do. We were trying to deaden it with sinful activities. We were trying to deaden it with petty crime. And that's not where the answer lies. Yeah, we can slip into depression. We slip into spiritual misery. And it's because it's like the passage we looked at from Isaiah last night. We're just like the trouble. There's no peace, says God, for the wicked. Our despondency and our depression and our melancholy and our fears and our anxieties, these are from the enemy, not God. God is not responsible. Satan is responsible for our cursed environment in which we live. I want you to notice what is said in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 17 when God is pronouncing judgment not only upon the devil but upon Adam and Eve. And here's what he said to Adam. Verse 17, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you saying you shall not eat of it Curse it, look at that, verse 17. Curse it is the ground for your sake. I want to stop and think about something. Before sin entered into the world, the Garden of Eden was a pristine garden. It served Adam's needs. Yes, he tended it. Yes, he cared for it. But it gave forth fruit abundantly. But now we find, curse it is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. I want you to stop and think about that. Not only, not only do we have to work the ground, not only do we have to weed the ground, not only do we have to cultivate the ground, but I'll tell you something, the earth has been cursed. We are at its misery. I'll tell you. Why are there earthquakes? Did God do it? No. Sin did it when the devil introduced sin into the world and the earth is cursed. We're at its mercy and at its misery. Why are there tornadoes? Why are there hurricanes? Why are there tsunamis? Why are there floods and droughts, frigid cold, stifling heat? Why are there bacteria? Why are there viruses going around? Why are all these things happening? Is it God's fault? Did God bring these things about? No, 
The ground was cursed because of the sin that Adam and Eve brought into the world. The earth is subject to its curse. And it's not the devil, it's not God's fault, but it is the devil's fault that brought these curses. Know your enemy. Know who's responsible for these things. And furthermore, it is Satan and not God who is responsible for the death of all mankind. We got a glimpse of that in verse 19 when he said that you were taken out of the ground, dust you are, and to dust you shall return, but also drop down to verse 22. And then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Let's make these decisions. And now let us put, uh, let's put out his, and now lest he put out his hand and take of the tree of life to eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. And he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way, for what? To guard the way to the tree of life. And as a result of that, men began to die when they were separated from the tree of life. And I'm going to tell you, when, when, when the devil brought death into this world, th this includes all the sicknesses and all the pain and all the suffering that's associated with death. It's the devil. It's not God. God didn't do this. God, God didn't cause this to happen. This is a result of what the devil has done. This is, an enemy has done this. And so when there's, you know, strokes and cancer and heart disease and COVID-19 and all of these things that we're dealing with that's scaring us to death, all of these things were not brought by God. These things were brought by the devil. And, and we need to be surprised about these things. Because this has been happening ever since the, the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve succumbed to that temptation, the temptation of the devil, and the devil introduced all of these things into this world, and we're receiving that. We're, 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 we're suffering from that today. You know, I've got to tell you, you know, one of the things, you can read Genesis chapter 5, and it, it's an interesting chapter. Genesis chapter 5 lists a, a lot of people that lived a long, long time. And you read about this one living that long, and this one living that long, and this one living that long. And you read about Methuselah, and he's lived 969 years and all. And we just sit there and we just are amazed at the longevity of these people. But God didn't reveal that in Genesis 5 to remind us of how long these people lived before the flood. That's not why it's there. There are three little words that's found after each one of these men and their longevity. And this is what God wants us to wrap our minds around. And he died. It didn't matter if he lived 60 years, 70 years, 969 years. This man died. And he died because of the things that the devil has introduced into this world. An enemy has done this. And we need to recognize that. And when these bad things happen, we cannot blame God. We cannot lay this at the feet of God. Job, I, I, I said this the other evening, you know, Job sort of serves as a, as a microcosm to all of these bad things that are happening. And when we look into the book of Job, we can see some, some information there that I think is very, very applicable to what it is that we're going through. In Job chapter 2 and verse 7, it was Satan who went out from the presence of the Lord. It was Satan who struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. It was Satan. It was the enemy who has done this. Satan, not God, is responsible for this. God, yeah, I tell you what, Jesus came into this world to bring light, not darkness. Jesus came into this world to bring life, not death. He came into the world to bring hope, not despair. And so when we give God a bad reputation, we're just really attacking the goodness of God. Know your enemy. Jesus came to destroy our enemy who had the power of death, Hebrews 2 and verse 14. God doesn't want us to suffer. And I'm going to tell you something else. God doesn't want us to go to hell. God does not want us to be lost. I, I hear people sometimes saying, how, how can a loving God kick somebody into hell for an eternity?
How, how can a loving God send somebody to where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth? How can a, how can a loving God send somebody to the fiery abyss known as Gehenna or hell? How, how can that happen? And, 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 and sometimes, you know, I've, I, I've struggled to try to give some kind of some sense to that and, and talk about that. And, and, and my response is, you, you know, God has just given you what you want. You, you wanted to live your life without God. And so God recognizes that. And God is going to allow you to, you know, exist in eternity without Him. And the only place that you can exist in eternity without Him is in hell. But hell was created for the devil and his angels. God didn't create hell for you. God didn't create hell for me. It was created for the devil and his angels. What God is doing, God is saying, if this is how you want to live without me, then I'm going to respect that and you can live without me throughout eternity. But the only place that that can happen is in the fiery abyss known as hell. So it's not that God is being unkind. God is being kind to you to give you exactly what you want. And I hope that's really not what you want this evening. I hope you want to have a relationship with God. I hope you understand that your enemy wants to see you be destroyed and wants you to be with him in eternity, being burned by that flame forever and forever. It's Jesus who calls upon you to come to Him if you're heavy and are heavy laden. Jesus is asking for you to accept the truth of the Scripture that He is the Son of God. Believe that with all of your heart. Turn from a life of sin. Repent. Confess your faith in Him before this body of people and before the angels in heaven. And allow someone to baptize you tonight into Christ to see you raised to walk in newness of life. Know your enemy. Your enemy is not God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is seeking to reward you. Won't you accept that treasure? Do so right now. As together we stand and as we sing.